So we've talked about what a limit is, and we've talked about how continuity works, what it means for a function to be continuous. So the next step is to apply and extend that knowledge, and the way we do that is by looking at infinite limits and redefining the way that we think about asymptotes. So if you think back to either years past or to, just the, to the beginning of this year, when we talk about a vertical asymptote, we're used to ter uh, talking about these as restrictions on the domain. Right? If I think about something like 1 over x, I can't plug in 0, and it turns out that there's an asymptote at 0. Well, we see this happen in this graph over here. Right? There's a vertical asymptote at what looks like x equals negative 1. But we can be more specific. We can update this. So our updated definition is to say that some number c, x equals c, is a vertical asymptote if the limit as x approaches that number c from the right approaches, we'd say approaches positive or negative infinity. And the same is true from the left, right? So the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x also approaches either positive or negative infinity. And we see that happen with our graph here, right? The limit as x approaches negative 1 coming from the right to the left. So go this way, approaches negative infinity. And the same thing happens here. If I start from the left, head toward the right, I approach positive infinity. So that's one way graphically we can show, we can tell that there's an asymptote there, and we'll kind of see how this works algebraically a little bit later on. We'll do the same thing for horizontal asymptotes. So we are, we're used to talking about these as restrictions on the, on the range. Uh, you can see right, right from our graph here, there's a horizontal asymptote here. And we had a whole set of rules when we first talked about this, right? I said, well, let's start by defining a rational expression with leading coefficient in the numerator a of degree n leading coefficient in the denominator b with degree d. And we had compared n and d. We got a whole bunch of sets of rules, right? If n was greater than d, there were no horizontal asymptotes. If, whoops, we'll do less than next. If it's less than, there's a horizontal asymptote at 0. And if they were equal, then we took the ratio of the leading coefficients, and that became our horizontal asymptote. These are still super important, and I would never tell you to ignore these. The book never really talks about them. I'm not crazy about the way our book teaches horizontal asymptotes and their connection to limits. I think you should still stick with these rules. But we do want to talk about this in a limit context, just so we know what these mean. So our updated definition... is to say y equals some number c. Actually, we'll use a different variable here. y equals k is a horizontal asymptote if, well, now my limit's not approaching k. My limit's approaching either plus or minus infinity. I'm just going to kind of combine the notations. So if the limit, as I either get larger and larger without bound, or um, my number gets more and more negative is my limit equals that number, right? So I'm approaching, I'm approaching that number. I'm approaching that number. So here, right, the limit of this function as I approach infinity is, looks like it's one. So we would say that there's a horizontal asymptote at one. Well, there's one addition to our discussion of um, asymptotes and well let's just consider this function here so here's the function x squared plus 2x plus 1 over x and if we notice this graph we notice a couple things we notice that looks like there is a vertical asymptote right here at 0 so x equals 0 and we can tell that from the function right there's no way I could plug in zero and get a result, so that makes sense. But there's no horizontal asymptote, right? There's no horizontal asymptote, which again, that makes sense. The degree of the numerator 
is greater than the degree of the denominator. What's new and what's maybe more interesting is that it looks like there's actually some kind of a boundary here along this line. Well, it's a little strange that we're not used to dealing with either non-horizontal or non-vertical asymptotes, but we do have them. We can see them right here. So what is this? Well, we call it a slant asymptote, or IB likes to call it an oblique asymptote. And these occur when the numerator has to be greater than the denominator, but the numerator specifically needs to be one higher than the degree of the denominator. Right? So in the case up here, degree of my numerator is 2 degree of my denominator equals 1, so my numerator degree is 1 more than my denominator degree, so this, this works. And how do we find the equation of the slant asymptote? Well, this occurs at a function equal to the quotient after dividing numerator by deno uh, denominator. So I'll just say the quotient after division you're gonna have a remainder. We can just ignore the remainder. We don't care about the remainder. We just care about the quotient. So if I were to take my example up here, let me just copy it down so we have some room to work here. If I were to divide this one through, and this one's fairly straightforward because it's just the single term. So I'm gonna get x plus two plus 1 over x. And again, ignore the denominator, the remainder. This is my slant asymptote. And sure enough, this actually is x plus 2, because if you look, I'm counting by 2s here. So this my slant asymptote, sure enough, is the line y equals x plus 2. Let's try a quick example. Sketch the graph, label all asymptotes and intercepts. So it's actually easiest in this case then to start with my asymptotes and my intercepts. So let's start with my asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes, well, I can't divide by zero. So when x is zero, that would create division by zero. So there's my vertical asymptote. Horizontal asymptotes, well, the degree is two here and the degree is one here, numerator greater than denominator tells me there are none. We also notice, though, I should say n equals 2, that we do, in fact, satisfy this condition that n equals d plus 1. So because n equals d plus 1, let's divide through to find the equation of my slant asymptote. So when I divide everything through, I'm going to get x plus 2 over x. I said ignore the remainder. So this is the equation of my slant asymptote. So far, so good. Let's just get these on my graph. So x equals 0 is a vertical asymptote. And if you remember, I like to put the dashes on the outside of the axes just so it's visible. Um, y equals x is my slant asymptote. So let's get that graphed here. Let's find our intercepts. This might help us graph the function a little bit better. So my y-intercept would occur when x is 0. Well, I can't do that, so there are no y-intercepts. My x-intercepts are where the function is equal to 0. So it should be, say, 0, go plus 2. Well, that doesn't have any real solutions either, so there are no x-intercepts. At this point, well, if we're kind of stuck still, I suppose it wouldn't hurt to maybe just test a couple points to make sure I'm in the right spots. So maybe we'll test x equal to 1. So I'm going to get 
y equal to 3. So here's one point. So that's going to tell me I'm bound by these two asymptotes. I've got to cross this point. So maybe my graph is going to look something, whoops. Maybe my graph is going to look something like that. And I can do the same thing with maybe negative 1. I'm going to get negative 3. So here's negative 3. Again, I'm bound by these two asymptotes. I have to cross that point at some point. So maybe my graph looks like this. And the one thing I haven't done yet is just label everything. So let me do that really quick. We've got x equals 0. We've got y equals x. I've got the point 1, 3. And I've got the point negative 1, negative 3. I want to make sure everything is labeled properly. 